rethinking Jesus. You know, I was um, I heard a story this last week uh, that I want to tell you. It's about two hunters, and every year they would go to Alaska and they would go moose hunting. And so a little small plane would go into a remote area, drop them off. The pilot said, "Hey, in three days I'll pick you up at this exact spot. Meet me here." Three days later, the two hunters, they were there. The pilot flies in, and he gets out, and he sees the two hunters and laying there on the snow are two moose. And the pilot said, guys, I told you when I left that you could only shoot one. We don't have enough room on the plane to put both of them uh, in. It's just too much weight. Well, the two hunters started arguing with the pilot, and they argued and argued with him, and they said, you know, last year we did it. Last year, the pilot let us put both moves on the plane, and, and come on, won't you let us do it? And they argued so long that finally the pilot gave up, and he said, you know what? He said, if you did it last year, and it was the same type of plane, uh, then, then all right, we'll, we'll go ahead and do it. So they loaded the plane with the two moves, with everything else. They took off, but it was way too much weight, and the plane could not get the, the altitude that it needed, and it clipped the top of the bluff, and it crashed, and everyone survived, but the two hunters got out of the plane, and they're looking around, and they're assessing all of the damage and what went wrong, and then one says, where in the world do you think we are? And the other hunter was looking back and forth, and he said, you know, he said, I think we're about a half mile further from where we crashed last year. Don't you question at times the way that people think, don't you? I mean, people can just think bizarre ways. Well, that's what this whole series is about, rethinking Jesus, because many times we can have a concept in our head that is absolutely different than the concept of that same topic that Jesus talked about. In this series, six weeks long, we have started off talking about the words that come out of our mouth, the power of the words and what Jesus had to say about that. The next week I talked about faith. Do we really have faith? We can say it all day long, but do we have faith? The next week I talked about forgiveness, maybe one of the most powerful sermons uh, that I've preached in a long, long time because of what Jesus had to say about forgiveness. And many times the concept of forgiveness in our head is not what Jesus said at all. And then we went from there to last week, and I talked about the seven pillars of wisdom, that if you want to be a wise person, not just a well-educated person, but a spiritually wise person, there are seven pillars that you can build upon. It was great information from, from the uh, book of Proverbs. And today I want to talk to you about another very important topic, and the topic today is truth. Do we really know what truth is? It was uh, George Orwell who said this, in a time of Universal deceit. Telling the truth is a revolutionary act. That for people that, that just simply tell the truth, I mean, it's revolutionary. Because what we find today is, is when you tune into the television, the evening news, late night talk shows, I mean, you, you find that, that it's just filled with story after story after story of, of lies and deception and cover-ups and where people are accusing the Republicans for lying and, 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 and accusing the Democrats of lying and everybody's lying and, and you start kind of getting the feeling that the dominant quality of a national leader is, is the ability to skirt the truth. But I want to tell you as born-again believers and followers of Christ that there's no room to move back and forth on this issue, but it is simply understanding that we are people of truth and we speak truth. You know, Jesus, Jesus made, this, or, or, you know, he made so many statements about truth, and, and I want to tell you what truth is not. Truth, and a lot of people get this, this confused, but truth is not based on human opinion. I want to tell you, I have heard some of the craziest opinions from people. You cannot base truth on what someone tells you. You cannot base truth on, on traditional patterns and habits. And a lot of people do that. That they believe something because their parents believed it and their grandparents believed it. Therefore, if they believed it, I believe it. It's just what we've always believed. And it can be as, as, as wrong as wrong can be. You cannot base truth upon human logic. And there's a lot of great logic, and I want to tell you there's a lot of crazy logic out there. You cannot base truth on your intellect, on intelligence, on how many degrees you have. You can't base uh, truth on, on gray hair because someone is of age and they've had a lot of experience. But you base truth on what Jesus said in John 17, 17 when he was praying to his Father. And he said, sanctify my people with truth. Because your word is truth. 
And what you find is that the Word of God, the Bible that we have, that we understand that this is absolute truth to us. Now, it makes me go back and, and think of the, of the famous scene in the Bible. In John chapter 18, where Jesus is on trial and he's standing there in front of the governor whose name is Pilate. And Pilate is questioning him. And, and, and as you read the story, you find that Pilate is moved by this man, Jesus, and knows there is something unique and something different about him. And Jesus is standing there and he opens his mouth and he says, I have come to testify to the truth. And everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And Pilate is moved by these words. And Pilate looks back and says, what is truth? What is the real truth? And I can tell you that in our world today, people are searching for truth. Kathleen Parker, who was a syndicated columnist for the Washington Post, a couple of years ago did an interview with Franklin Graham, Billy Graham's son. And in this article, she became very critical of, of Mr. Graham and the reason why, because he made this statement to her, he said, I believe that Muslims need to be saved without being saved through Jesus Christ. They will not find heaven as their home. And because of that statement, and because of that interview, that Franklin Graham was removed from being the National Day of Prayer speaker at the Pentagon because they said his statement is not politically correct. Parker's article in this interview, she said, Graham's offense was expressing his belief that only Christians have God's ear and that Muslims and Hindus do not pray to the same God he does. She pointed out in the article that Graham's view did not set well with secular Americans. She quotes a survey showing that nearly two-thirds, two-thirds of evangelicals under the age of 35 believe that non-Christians can and will go to heaven. As she continued the interview, Graham said, I believe what I believe and I do not believe that you can go to heaven through being a Buddhist or a Hindu. I think Muhammad only leads to the grave. It was at the end of the column, she then, she then wrote her own opinion and she said that Graham needs to step into the 21st century of enlightenment and not be so narrow-minded. She uses this word enlightenment. You know, we all want to be enlightened. None of us want to be in the dark. And, and we use that word today and you hear it all the time because it's a modern sounding word. It's contemporary. It is, it's hip. It's chic. It's something that a lot of people want to use. I want to be enlightened in this world. And, and in other words, what that means is that it's breaking through some old fashioned, outdated beliefs like the ridiculous belief that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. And in Parker's view of this article, her thought was the narrow view of evangelist Graham is not just out of bounds, but it is absolutely embarrassing. You know, today anyone who claims that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven is going to face fierce criticism in the society that we live. And I want to tell you, Parker was absolutely right when she talked about Christians under the age of 35, that they are struggling today with the concept that Jesus is the only way. And the reason why is because we have been so inundated by so much information in the world and, and that it causes us to second guess what the Bible really has to say. Because you can take this demographic of evangelicals under 35, and you can ask them the question, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And without question, they will say, absolutely, yes. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave on the third day? And they will say, absolutely, yes, I believe that with all my heart. But then you could ask the question, do you believe that Jesus is the only way that anyone gets to heaven? And all of a sudden, they become very, very uncomfortable with that question. And the reason why is because we live in a shrinking world. Just a generation ago, you could 
be raised here in Albuquerque, in Dallas, in Phoenix, and never come across, never meet a Muslim, never have a conversation with a Hindu, but because of the shrinking world through the internet and through social media, through immigration, through the mobility of, of modern life, there has never been a time in history of where there has been such a mixing of people and cultures and religions like today. You know, there was a day, and it wasn't long ago, and, 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 and certainly in my lifetime as a younger man, when we would talk about Hinduism and, and we would talk about Islam in a very detached way. Because when you talked about these Eastern religions, they were those people. They were the people way over there across the sea, thousands of miles away from us. But just like Christianity has, has gone from America into every nation around the world, now also Eastern religions are now flooding into America. And now we find that, that these Eastern religions are at our doorstep. And now we go to school with with people that are far different from ourselves. We work with those people. They're our neighbors, and they become our friends. People from other countries, people of other beliefs, people that serve other gods become our friends, people that we care about, people that we love. We befriend them, walk with them. But one day, in a conversation, it comes up that you're a Christian. And that you have to explain to them that, that you believe that Jesus is the only way that anyone goes to the Father and goes into heaven. That it's not through any other name. It's not through any other God. It is only Jesus Christ. And that moment can be very embarrassing for many people. And you seem to choke on those words because they're such great people. They're friends of mine, people I care about, and we again start second-guessing the Word of God. Maybe there are other ways. You know, if you claim that Jesus is the only way, then you're going to be labeled as being arrogant, intolerant, narrow-minded, and there's not one of us in this room that want to be labeled like that. And those labels cause us to start wavering in our thoughts. And that we start questioning all of this. And then we stand in the danger of reducing Christianity down to the lowest common denominator that all religions are equal. And at that moment, what we do with that kind of thinking is we take Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, and we bring Him down on the same level as thousands of other gods in this world. It was several years ago, there was a, an exclusive golf gathering of about 30 business executives. These men were handpicked to come, and it was just a, a great, great time of where they came, and they got to meet Tiger Woods, and, and they got to have a golf lesson with him, and they play a round of golf with him. And at the luncheon that day, just 30 of these businessmen were able to gather with Tiger, and there it was a question and answer time, and they were having a great time. People were asking all kinds of questions and, and laughter until one man stood up who was a representative from Nike, and he asked Tiger Woods this question. He said, Tiger, I want to know, what religion did you grow up believing in? And I just want to ask you, would you ever consider Jesus Christ becoming your Lord and Savior? When he asked that question, they said it was like you could hear a pin drop. That it silenced everything in that room. And, and they were mortified that this man would ask such a question. And everyone on pins and needles waited for the response. And Tiger Woods simply made this statement. He said, my father was a Christian. Of course, Christianity was a major part of my life. But my mother is Asian and is a Buddhist. And both were a big part of my childhood, so I practice both faiths respectfully. And it just eased everyone. His answer was perfect. Because his answer was politically correct. His answer brought comfort. His answer is what everyone would be able to accept. 
It's the blending of, of religions which sounds so good. I just mix them, I blend them, and I make them work together. But let me tell you, what Tiger Woods said that day is absolutely a myth because it cannot take place, it cannot happen. The idea that, that all paths lead to one God is absolutely insulting to every major religion. This is why. It's because when you hear people say, all religions are equal. All religions go to the same place. Then you can know two things. That the person who says that absolutely does not know what they're talking about. And they have never studied any religion in their life. Because all major world religions claim to be the one exclusive way to God. For example, Muslims. Whenever you, you talk to a, a Muslim, they will tell you that there is only one true religion in the world, and that is Islam. That the only way that anyone enters into heaven is through the submission to Allah that is described in the Quran. There is only one way to heaven, and it is Allah, which is far, far different from the God that we serve. When it comes to the Mormons, the Mormons... They believe that they are the only true church on earth today and everyone else that follows another belief is, is in deception. When it comes to Judaism, you find that the Jews 2,000 years ago killed Jesus Christ because He claimed to be the Messiah, the Jews' King. And they rejected Him and said He is not our King and still today they're waiting for their Messiah. What they believe is that Jesus Christ, anyone who follows Him, leads you nowhere but to the death, but to your death, because He is nothing but a heretic. And for the Christian belief, that we believe that there is no way that anyone can go to heaven except through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ only. And so it's not even logical when you hear people say things like, well, it's, it's just all these gods with different names, but it's just all one God. It is absolutely impossible because all of these gods directly oppose one another, and they do not agree at all on how we get to heaven. So it's easy, it's very easy for us to say that all roads lead to heaven when you haven't studied the road map of these different religions. You know, the popular phrase today, Oh, we love throwing this around, and you hear it on, on the daytime talk shows all the time. It's the religious pluralism that, that exists today. But again, I'm telling you, it doesn't exist. It is absolutely a myth. But celebrities, Hollywood stars, entertainers, I mean, they embrace this way of thinking, and they're educating our young in America today by their thought process and by what they're saying, and they are saying this, this blending idea of all religions, because, again, it's politically correct, it's a popular liberal way of thinking, it's like, let's all embrace all religions, and whatever truth you think truth is, then that becomes truth to you. And it's crazy to base our truth, the truth of our eternal life, on, on simply personal opinion. Now, Sarah Michelle Giller, who is, who is a Hollywood star, and she was the, um, uh, the star in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, in an interview, this is what she said. She said, I consider myself a spiritual person. I believe in the idea of God, although it's my own personal ideal. I find most religions interesting, and I've been every kind of denomination, Catholic, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, and I've taken bits from everything, and I've customized it. Now, I don't know her, but I would venture to say she knows nothing about any of those religions at all. She is saying that because it's the cool thing to say. She's saying it because it's popular, because it's highly acceptable in our nation today. What it says is that I'm an open thinker, that I'm not closed thinking, I'm not narrow-minded, that I'm all-inclusive, and, and that everybody works together, and you just come and make up your own religion, you just make up your own thought process. 
But you'll find it doesn't work. It was some years ago the General Secretary of the World Council of Churches was asked to name the number one theological issue facing Christians worldwide. And this is what he said. He said, it's to keep the uniqueness of Christ. It's to keep Jesus Christ exclusive. It's where we understand that, that, that we serve Jesus Christ as the Son of the living God, and that this God, Jesus Christ, rises out of the crowd of all gods and stands above all other gods because He is the true living God. Now, what does the, what does the Bible really say? Now, let's go back to what Jesus had to say. And, and Jesus, one day, standing in a crowd of people in John 14, 6, He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, this rattled a lot of people. This, this was a very, very narrow statement. Here you have all these people, many of them Jews, that have one thought process. You have all these other Gentiles that serve all these other gods, and they have their ideas. And Jesus is saying to them that if you want heaven as your home... I'm the way. I am the way, the only way. And, and he was very exclusive, and he was saying that apart from me, you're not going to find heaven. Now, I want you to notice that when you look at this, this one verse, how personal it is. Because we're not saved by a religion. We're not saved by a church. But we are saved through Jesus Christ only. Amen. Only. Now, in Acts chapter 4 and, and verse 12, here Peter comments on this very thing, and listen to how he words it. He says, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name. You can't call God by a name that He does not go by. There is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. The apostle Paul jumped in on all of this in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 11 where he says, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. When you take these three verses and look at them, what you find is that they're saying that there is there's no other way, that there is no other name, there is no other foundation. And then we read in 1 Timothy 2.5, where Paul goes on to say, and there is one God and one mediator between God and men, and the man, Christ Jesus. He's saying that there is a mediator that came. And what he's talking about here is how that, that when we are born into this world, we sense it and we know it, that we are separated from God. When we are in this world, we know that we are sinful creatures. We are highly aware of that by what is in our minds, in our thought processes, in our actions. We know that there is an evil in all of us, and we are separated from God at the time of birth. And what he's referring to here is that one day, Jesus Christ came into the world to become the mediator to now stand between man and God and he stood in what is called the sin gap and he stands there in that gap becomes the bridge between man and God and reunites them together but the only way to God is through that mediator Jesus Christ and you find that it's it's utterly exclusive this is the reason why that that Christianity is hated, and this is what saddens me greatly, is that in our nation today, that, that even here, our own people, our own nation, there is a great hatred that is growing up against Christianity. And the reason why is because of the mindset that it is so narrow. But Jesus didn't back down from that. You find that in Matthew 7, starting with verse 13, again, standing in a crowd of people, that he wanted them to know the truth. And this is what he said. He said, for wide, wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. Broad is the road that leads to the place called hell. 
And then he goes on, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to eternal life, and only a few will find it. And there were so many people, even at, in his day as well as today, that people will hear those words and they will say, I cannot believe in something so narrow. I cannot believe in something like that. I refuse to do so. But I want to remind you of something. That all truth, doesn't matter what it is, if it's truth, it's narrow. If you'll go back with me to the first grade when your teacher taught you that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Now, sometimes it doesn't equal 5, and sometimes it doesn't equal 3. But it will always equal 4 because it is absolutely a narrow truth that never changes. There is nothing wrong with something being narrow because it tells us that this is what truth is. It doesn't vary. You know, when you think about where we are today, as a people, as a nation, as a world, you know, there's no turning back the clock to what we would call the good old days when the world wasn't so complicated as it is today. You know, I think that we're living probably in the greatest days in the history of mankind. And I say that because we may be the last generation before the return of Christ. And when you think about the responsibility that is upon all of us, and it's not by accident that you were created and you were born for this season and for this time, and that we very well may be that last generation. And when we sit in our homes and we turn on the television, and we watch the mess that the world is in, and how that every day that passes that it seems to increase, and we all know biblically where all of this is headed. And you can look at all the pain, the destruction, the hurt, the devastation, the sin. You can see all of it coming unraveled, and you can be so depressed by what you see on television, or you can be so encouraged by the fact that what an hour of opportunity that God has placed us in, that there has never, ever been a time like this. There has never, ever been a time that there has been a blending of nations and cultures and people of where we as Americans are no longer having to go to foreign lands, but that we have the opportunity to invest in people right where we are that are so far away from God that can have an impact upon their lives and upon their families and upon their cultures. How would you feel if one day I was standing not far away, maybe 50 feet from a drop-off that dropped off 1,500 feet down below these jagged rocks. But I'm standing 50 feet away and I'm just visiting with someone, but I can see someone over my friend's shoulder that is headed toward the bluff. And as I kind of watch him at a distance, he's an older gentleman, and, and then I, I begin to realize this man is blind and cannot see, and he's headed toward the cliff. And yet I continue my conversation, don't really care what he's doing, it's his life, he can do whatever he wants to do, I don't want to be involved, and, and I just let him drop to his death. Or I could stop my conversation, and I could yell at him and say, hey, stop right where you are, stop. And he stops, and I said, don't make a move. Just stand there, I'm coming, because I want to take you by the hand, and I want to lead you to safety, because I am motivated by caring, motivated by love. And there are people all around us that we go to school with, we work with, and we never say a word, and we know where they're headed, we see the devastation, we see where the end is all going to be, and we never say a word. You know, one of the things that bothers me so much about Christian people, and I'm one of them, but I don't want to be like this. 
I watch how people interact with people of, of other cultures and other religions, and, and, and they're talking to a Muslim, they're talking to a Hindu, they're talking to someone that has a far different belief than they do, and, and they, they argue with them all the time. You know, we, we need to back off of that. And when we're befriending people and engaging with people, that allow them to tell you about their religion without you jumping in and interrupting every three seconds and going, no, 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 that doesn't match up with the Bible. No, but let them talk. Let them talk. What it is, it's respect for them. And that you're able to, to have a, just a conversation. Let them talk. You talk. Somewhere down the line, let me tell you, truth begins to surface. But truth only surfaces when you begin to operate and mimic Jesus Christ. And how Jesus dealt with people. And how He dealt with those that were so far away from Him, so far away from God. But He did it in such a gentle and a loving and a caring manner. And it didn't have to all be done in, in three seconds, but He allowed it all to play out. And when we care about people, let me tell you, you begin to project the image of Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, truth begins to rise. And they begin to want what you have. Because if Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, and there is only one God in the world, that what that one God has is something that is so life-changing and so dynamic and so life-giving that it will cause people to hunger because what they're serving and what they're following offers nothing but death at all. And truth will rise out of that. You know, Jesus calls us by name. Jesus is calling some of you by name this very morning. That Jesus is saying that I am the way, I am the truth, I am the only way. And something inside, you sense that and you feel that and you know that. What I want to do this morning is I want to pray for you. And I want us to, to seek, just like we did last week, praying for wisdom. I want us to ask God, help me to have a view of truth of where I'm not contaminated by this world way of, of thinking. But Lord, I'm transformed by the Word of God and by what the Word of God has to say. The Word of God is narrow, but the Word of God is wide in love and compassion. I'd like to ask everyone to stand, if you'd stand with me this morning. If you'd just bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment, I want to I pray with you. And I want to ask you today that maybe you've walked in here and maybe you're, you're still questioning all of this and who is God and who is Jesus and is this right and I mean, who's right and who's wrong? And yet something moves you this morning. There's something inside of you and before we walk out of this auditorium that, that you're wanting me to pray with you and I want to pray with you right where you are this morning to receive Jesus into your life and where something new starts right now. Something so dynamic, so powerful, and what you're basically saying is that, that I don't want to live my life on my own anymore, but I want something supernatural, I want something real, I want something dynamic to lead me, to guide me, to help me in life. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I want us to, to make this a private moment. How many of you right now, just where you stand, that in this ending prayer you would say, Pastor, I want you to pray for me because I want Jesus in my life. I want to invite him in right now into my life. I want to pray the prayer. How many of you would just shoot up a hand? Hold it up. Hold it up. Wow. Many, 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 many hands are going up. I want to tell you this is a proud moment for you. This is an amazing moment for you because you're about to ask the divine to come into your life. You're about to ask the God of this world, the creator, the designer, to come into your life and to walk with you, and to, and to, and to help you, and, and to transform you. You see, this moment right here is, has nothing to do with religion. It has nothing to do with becoming a member of this church or any other church. It has to do with you having a relationship with your God. And so I'm going to pray. you got to pray your own prayer. you got to pray it yourself. you got to speak whatever you want. Let me tell you, there's not a right way or wrong way of doing it. It's just simply saying, God, I want you. I, I want you today. I want you to come in. And he said, if you'll ask me to come in, I'll come in. Let me pray with you and, and let me guide you. Lord Jesus, as we pray, Lord, today I stand here realizing that I'm far away from you. Lord, I realize that, that I am a sinner. Lord, just like every other man and every other woman. But God, today I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. 
And I'm asking that you would come into my life. And Lord, today that something new starts. And Lord, I'm opening up my heart, my mind, Lord, my will. And I'm just saying, Lord, God, you are my God. Lord, I serve you as God. I, I know that you are the creator and I want you. I want the true living God in my life. And Lord, now come in. And Lord, I realize that, that, that you would begin to speak to me and guide me. And Lord, that my life begins to change for the better. But Lord, that I, I'm not coming to you to become some religious person. God, I'm coming to you to become Christ-like. And so, Lord, change me. Transform me. Make me better than I've ever been before. And God, I thank you for what you're doing in my life. But most of all, Lord, I look forward to one day spending an eternity with you in your home called heaven. And so, Lord, I give you my life today. I accept you as my Lord and my God. And in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen, Amen, Amen. God is a great, great God. Amen.